Hello, everyone. My name is Kara Moncrief, and I am the Clinical Communications Director for Viora. And welcome to the refit webinar. I think this one will be not too long. You know, some of them can go for four hours. <laughs> and since this is on one specific protocol, it will be pretty quick and easy. Um, and then your questions are welcomed if you want to unmute yourselves. You're able to to ask questions um, as we go. Don't, don't worry about interrupting me since we're only covering one topic and it's not multiple topic, topics where we need to keep on track. You can ask at any time if some, something doesn't make sense or maybe you've been working with um, a specific client and you're maybe not seeing what you're thinking that you should see. Whatever it may be, you can always ask. You can write into the chat if you don't want to unmute yourselves. Writing into the chat is fine too. So um, let me share my screen. I'm just pulling up my RF PowerPoint just to kind of go through a bit of the details of the technology. Actually, before I do that, let me just talk about refit in general of why we use it and what kind of patients we're looking for for refit. And then I'll show you the PowerPoint, the technology and how that works with everything. So <clears throat> for refit, I want you to think of um, patients that have post baby belly. So the tissue has been stretched from having a baby. Now they have laxity. Um, I want you to think of someone like post-traumatic weight loss, um, either if they did it in the natural way um, through bariatrics or if they did it in the natural way of just eating healthy and exercising. Um, now, there can be uh, some differences with weight loss clients, and some people don't need skin tightening at all if they've gained a lot of weight. If you think of a patient who's 20 years old and they gained... 50 pounds and only had it on for six months, typically their skin is going to bounce back to normal because of their age and they heal really well. Um, their skin is just really high integrity. Uh, additionally, they didn't keep the weight on for very long. So it wasn't a, a period of time to really start damaging the tissue. Um, now let's take somebody maybe in their 40s or 50s and they had gained 100 pounds and they had it on for five years. This is when we start getting into a challenging situation of the skin being stretched for that long plus their age, then typically they're, they're left with some laxity. So this would be the protocol that you would use for them. Uh, think post cool sculpting and maybe they have some laxity. Think post liposuction, you know, any type of removal of fat volume and now we have some, some loose skin. Um, but additionally, not only for post baby belly or dramatic weight loss, where the skin has been stretched and now you now they've lost weight, the volume, and now it's lax. But additionally, as we age. So as we age, our skin starts to lose its elasticity and its collagen. And so we start to get um, loose skin on the arm. Think of areas of like thin skin, our inner thighs, thin skin, um, our arms, especially uh, the lower part of our arms, thin skin. Um, above the knees is an area that typically becomes lax with age. So it doesn't have to just be in, inner thighs and arms, it could really be anywhere on the body that with age we start to get laxity. This is a great, great protocol for them for, for many reasons and we'll go through that. So that's the patient I want you to think of. Now, why do we have these issues? So I'm gonna talk about areolar tissue. And this is the tissue that is in um, our sub, because we have connective tissue in our um, dermis and in our subcutis or our subcutaneous, where our fat is. So there's connective tissue really found everywhere. And it can be dense connective tissue or it can be loose connective tissue. We're not ever dealing with dense connective tissue. That's something like cartilage. Uh, think of how strong cartilage is. It's because it's very dense connective tissue. Ours and our skin and our, and our subcutis is loose connective tissue. And it's made up of a lot of different things. It's a whole matrix of, of stuff. And I went through a lot of it on Skin 101, and I'll go through it in even more detail when we do Skin 102, which is gonna be towards the um, end of the summer. But we have fibroblast cells, and these fibroblast cells secrete proteins, fiber, collagen, 
and they secrete these fibers and that's what really collagen so we have different types of, of fibers in our skin we have collagen we have elastic and we have reticular so uh, um, think of i'll go back think of collagen giving our strength to our skin it makes it strong it makes it thick think of elastic as giving um really stretch to our skin so we have collagen that gives us our strength and elastic that gives us our stretch so if our skin is stretched it can bounce back if i pull my skin right now it can bounce back to normal that's our elastic or elastin fibers collagen is really the strength of our skin so they're different and um, the reticular fibers that are in there are going to give us really kind of our support system um, another thing that gives us the support of our skin is the ground substance that is because with loose connective tissue there's a lot of ground sub substance there's not as much fiber like collagen elastin as there is ground substance the ground substance is the GAGs that I talked about on Skin 101, which is the glycosaminoglycans. So that's like hyaluronic acid. That's one GAG that's in our skin, hyaluronic acid. And it really gives us the turgidity in our skin, really the fullness of our tissue. So all of this collagen elastin is in the dermis and surrounding it is all this ground substance. Now, in the subcutis, in the hypodermis, we have adipocytes or adipocytes, different names for them, uh, which are our fat cells. But within those fat cells, we also have that loose connective tissue, that areolar tissue. So really, everything that we deal with with Viora, when we're dealing with the upper papillary dermis, the lower reticular dermis, or the subcutis, our fat layer, we're dealing with connective tissue. So as we age, our, our collagen, so our collagen is really thick. When you look at collagen compared to um, uh, elastic fibers, they're very different. Where elastic fibers are very thin and they're branch-like, almost like a tree. Where our collagen fibers, they almost look like a rod. They're thick, they're straight, they're strong. When we age, we start to lose a lot of that. So our collagen is no longer thick, it becomes thin. Um, our elastic is not as strong, so we don't get the bounce back like we used to. And you guys probably know this with, you know, just overall in the industry and aging. Um, additionally, we have something called an epidermal dermal junction. It's really where the epidermis, the top layer of our skin, meets the papillary dermis. So right, right below it where our collagen elastin is. And when we're young, the papillary dermis has these fingers and they come up and the epidermis is kind of interwoven into the papillary dermis. If you guys were on with the Skin 101, um, or you may know this already, that the epidermis is avascular. So there's, there's no blood in the epidermis. So how does it get its nutrients, its oxygen, its nutrients, its, its blood, right? How do, how do we give it life to those squamous cells that are shedding every 28 days? It's these fingers that come into the epidermis and then allow the oxygen and nutrients to feed into the epidermis. As we age, it almost looks like those fingers are completely gone. So what happens too is our epidermis starts to thin because it doesn't have as much blood and um, therefore oxygen and nutrients to it. So a lot of things happen when we age. Additionally, we know we lose fat. We gain it in areas we don't want to, like our abdomen when we get older, but we lose a lot of fat in our face. Um, we, our, our overall subcutis starts to thin. So that's regular aging. We have you know, all kinds of things going on that's bad, we don't want. Now we think about weight gain and what is it doing to our skin when we gain weight? I want you to think of this more as like damage to the tissue. So with aging, like regular aging, we can still do damage to our tissue, right? Because we have internal and external aging. Internal aging is just you know chronological aging, our genetic makeup. And external aging is going to be sun and smoking and free radicals, but it's usually 90% of the time sun, unless you're a smoker and then, and then that's really cuts off the oxygen 
um, it, it restricts blood flow and, and it damages our skin as well. But sun really, really impacts the loss of collagen elastin because of the UV rays, right? So we do have external factors. We can get damage, but with weight gain, we get a mechanical damage to our tissue because when we gain weight, we are really ex um, stretching that skin. Therefore, we start to get, instead of really thick, um, really tightly woven collagen, abundant collagen, the collagen starts to become thin, less dense. And if you look at a histological photo of um, somebody that has lost a lot of weight, you can also see a moth-eaten appearance to the skin where the skin has been so stretched and so damaged that there's areas of missing collagen and elastin, okay? So in the papillary dermis with weight gain, and it's not, it, it is the weight gain, that's what's starting to cause the damage, but when you really see it is the weight loss. So when they have weight loss, um, the, the, um, the papillary, I talked about that being, usually it's normal, like thick collagen, branching elastin that starts to get that moth um, eating appearance. I made notes so I didn't forget to tell you guys anything. Um, additionally, there's signs of fibrosis, which isn't good because collagen, when, when we leave it alone and it's in its natural state and we're young and we didn't stretch it with weight gain, it is running in the same direction, very straight collagen strands. And when we start to stretch it and it feels like it's um, kind of like under attack and it needs to heal, it starts to create collagen in a way that creates fibrosis. So the collagen is very, there's a lot of irregular, uh, irregular irregularities to it, sorry. So it's damaged and that creates an issue to our tissue. Issue to our tissue, <laughs> love that. Um, in the reticular dermis, so that's in the papillary dermis, but in the reticular dermis, re really that's where our abundant collagen is. Um, the collagen starts to lose its normal shape, arrangement, and concentration. So think about that. We want a lot of concentration with, with collagen. It starts to lose that. It starts to lose its normal arrangement. Um, and then it could lead to fibrosis. Um, and then additionally, it's just its normal shape isn't there. So that's one of the things that you're seeing. But the biggest thing are short cut elastic fibers. So remember, elastic gives us our, our stretch and it allows our skin when we stretch it to bounce back. So when you, when you look at skin that has been stretched for years and for, from a lot of weight gain, you can see the elastic is very short and it's cut in areas. So that's why we're not getting the spring back to our tissue. So those are, those are the, the, um, really the, the causes of concern. And in the reticular dermis, you can see a moth-eaten appearance to those fibers as well. So not just in the papillary dermis, but in the reticular dermis. So that's why you're seeing these issues of you know, skin being stretched and not bouncing back. But additionally, age, we, we have these you know, somewhat the same problems too. So aging skin. Um, so additionally, so that's in the papillary and the reticular dermis. If you, if you think down into the hypodermis, when all of those fat cells are growing and growing and growing, we start to really gain weight and really stretch out that skin, that loose connective tissue starts to become uh, affected as well. So reticular, papillary, that's primary, the primary concern, but some of the hypodermis with those connective tissues become damaged. Okay, so that is, um, that is kind of a, an overview of why we're having these issues. Now I'll share my screen and we'll talk about the, the technology and how it really, really, really improves these issues. Oops, what happened? Oh, I shared my <laughs> wrong screen. Where's my, that's weird. Huh. I hope this is working, hold on. Will, uh, Donna, will you just write into the chat if you can see, or anyone, write into the chat that you can see my PowerPoint pulled up? Okay, let's see. 
there. Sorry, I hate when this happens when my computer kind of freaks out. It's okay, perfect. Thank you, Carly. Okay, so now we'll go into um, the actual technology and how we're fixing these issues. How, we, how do we get these amazing results when we're doing refit for these complications that we talked about? Aging, weight loss, baby, things like that. So with the, with the refit protocol, we're using the V form, or if you guys own the reaction, we're using the BC or the FC. These two technologies, most likely you have a V form because that's what most of our accounts have, but these two technologies have two things. They have radio frequency and vacuum. The radio frequency, I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail just because we have other webinars on that, but the radio frequency is generating heat to the tissue. And this is what we need. There's fibroblast cells that really live amongst and on all of the collagen elastin that you see in these layers of our skin. And that's what we need to stimulate. Because the fibroblast cells, remember, they secrete, I almost said secrete, <laughs> secrete these fibers that we're needing to keep our, our skin strong. And with heat, this is how we're able to do it. We additionally have vacuum. So I'll talk about that in just a bit. But those two in combination with one another is how we're getting these great results. With the refit protocol, we are always staying in mode four. So why? Well, one, we use mode four for preheating. Mode four for preheating and why we do it is mode four is really, it's one third of the energy going to all three depths of our tissue. So one third of the energy is gonna go to the subcutis or fat layer. One third of the energy is gonna go to the reticular dermis, collagen elastin. One third of our energy is gonna go to the papillary dermis, an, another one for collagen elastin. So remember everything we spoke about and all the changes that we have to our tissue, we need these three depths of penetration to get a, a really great improvement in the skin's integrity. We use it for preheating because we can preheat really fast when we're in all three depths. So with the V-form, typically we can preheat someone in one to two minutes. It could take up to five to six minutes depending on the patient's circulation. It really shouldn't take you over than that, longer than that though. If it's taking you longer than that, maybe you just need to decrease your zone size. Maybe you could go up in your RF energy. Maybe you could go up in your vacuum level energy, so on and so forth. So that's why we use mode four for preheating the body. Um, or if you're doing refit on the lower face, and we'll talk about why you would do refit on the lower face, why it works so well. We'll just talk about the body right now. So what was I gonna say? Okay, so preheating. We have an option between RF one through four and vacuum one through four. I typically with the, with the V form do RF four and vacuum four for preheating. It's usually really comfortable for the patient. They usually are comfortable. You can preheat them really fast. Great. Um, remember, higher vacuum level, the better um, circulation there is, so the quicker you can heat them. And RF4, typically most people are comfortable with that. But if they say, oh, that's too much heat, you can take it down to RF3. If they say, oh, that's pinching, you know, the vacuum's uncomfortable, you can take it down to three. There's no problem with that. But usually I just do four and four. If it's the reaction, I'll only do um, vacuum three, RF3 usually, just because that's where patients are usually more comfortable. And then I do stacked pulses, where I just hold the handpiece on one spot, release four pulses. I always ask them, was that okay? Usually they say yes, great, move forward with doing four. If four was too much, that's okay, just cut it back to three pulses. This is always adjustable. Every once in a while, if I have someone with poor circulation and I can't get them heated, I'll try five stacked pulses or six stacked pulses. I'll hold it down, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll make sure it was comfortable for them. I'll ask, is that okay? Yeah, it was fine. Okay, great. Move to the next spot. One, two, three, four, five, six, so on and so forth. I've never pulsed more than six because I think that would be a bit too much, but usually four stacked pulses is fine. Um, be careful with your vacuum though on thinner areas, like the arms here, that can easily bruise. So keep your vacuum a bit lower. Inner thighs can sometimes bruise easily keep your vacuum a little lower. Um, on uh, other areas like the abdomen or the back or the back of legs, anywhere they have loose skin that's not thin skin, then I usually do vacuum four. If you were gonna do refit on the lower face, you never ever go above a vacuum two, so a vacuum one or two, lower face or submental area. Okay, 
Um, since I'm talking a lot about vacuum, let me just go to that slide and then we'll come back to mode four. Uh, which slide? Here we go. I'll stay here. So we have a vacuum on this handpiece. Why is it so, so good for this specific protocol? The vacuum does quite a few things. One, it increases the depth of penetration. So when you're doing something like contouring or cellulite, you really need that. But additionally, the depth of penetration um, is nice for preheating too. Um, next, it works with the lymphatic system. So any excess swelling, edema that we have, we can take that down. Uh, thirdly, it increases circulation. That's huge. The more blood flow and the more circulation we have to the tissue, the better integrity and the better this tissue is going to respond to the treatment because blood is really what gives life to our skin. It brings in all of the oxygen and nutrients that our tissue needs to live and survive. So when we age, we lose a lot of blood vessel. We, we don't have as much blood flow to the tissue, so it becomes weaker. When we're young, we have a ton of blood flow, so our skin is really vibrant and healthy and youthful. So that vacuum increases that circulation, so everything responds better. Um, and then additionally, we work with the metabolism, which that really doesn't matter here as much. That more so is, is for cellulite and contouring, which I talk a lot about that on, um, on a previous webinar that I did. So we'll just talk about those things because it's important for refit. Okay, so now we'll come back to mode four. So with the refit protocol, we're always staying in mode four. So we preheat in mode four, we get them to temperature. And remember the temperature is between 39 and 42 degrees Celsius. I always try to push towards 42 degrees Celsius because I don't want areas to drop under too much. And if I'm only at 39, some areas may drop below 39 and then I'm not at the, um, at the clinical efficacious temperature that I need to be at. So I try to push towards 42 if I can, if I can get them there and if I can hold them there. If areas drop a little bit, they only drop to like 39, 40, and then that's fine. Um, so you preheat them, get them all preheated, and then we move into the actual treatment. So the treatment we stay in mode for the entire time. We set our timer for 14 minutes. We set our timer for 14 minutes and we drop our vacuum to one. Okay, so I'll explain all of these things. Why do we stay in mode four? So remember, we need to target the connective tissue everywhere. We wanna target the connective tissue in the, um, in the uh, subcutis, subcutaneous. Uh, we want to, and the, the junction between the um, reticular dermis and the subcutaneous. We want to target the reticular dermis because there's a lot of um, elastic and collagen fibers there, a lot, that's where most of them are. And additionally, we want to target the papillary dermis because there are collagen elastin fibers there as well. So we want to stimulate everything we can. So that's why we're in mode four. We know the handpiece is gonna do the job for us. When we set it to mode four, one third of the energy goes to the subcutis, one third of the energy goes to the reticular dermis, and one third of the energy goes to the papillary dermis. So that's why we stay there. Why do we drop, and by the way, we keep our RF, the, you could probably usually keep your RF the same throughout the whole treatment. It's whatever they're holding temperature at. So if they start going way above 42 degrees and you're on RF4, take it down, take it to RF3. But if you're on RF4 and they're just maintaining really well, then just stay there. You don't need to change anything. Um, what really matters, and, I, and sometimes people think, well, if I'm only on RF1, they're not gonna get as good of a treatment as if I were on RF4. That's not true. What matters is how is the body responding to the RF? It's our cells that start to generate the heat. So what matters is what is that temperature reading? What is that IR thermometer saying? If it's saying they're at 42 degrees, you're fine. You don't need to you know, crank up the RF that we're delivering because you're at that heated temperature you need to be at. Um, once you've preheated them, just a side note, you're usually not stacking too many pulses. You're usually doing like maybe one pulse, maybe a double stacked pulse just to maintain the temperature. If you were still doing four, they're probably going to go way over temperature. But if they're not staying at temperature at one to two stack pulses, then do more. So it's all based on what is that temperature telling you? What's the IR thermometer saying? Okay, so why do we drop it to vacuum one? 
we drop it to vacuum one because we don't want to push the heat all the way into the hypodermis. So the higher the vacuum, the more tissue we couple into the applicator and the more we push the heat down. So with this, they didn't come in for fat loss. If they came in for fat loss, we really want that heat down into the hypodermis, right? So that's the contouring cellulite protocol. With this one, we're wanting to, to really target the connective tissue. So we want it in that um, epidermal papillary junction, we want it in the hypodermis and reticular jun junction, and we want it all throughout the papillary and reticular dermis, and a little bit into the um, uh, subcutaneous where that connective tissue is. So that's why we always drop our vacuum to one. We, we don't want to focus too much on the hypodermis. We want to focus everywhere. Um, and that's what's going to give our, our skin tightening effect. Okay, so, you know, I'll just, hmm, I don't remember what slide is, that I have, like, number of treatments and how often, so I'll just talk about it. So number of treatments really, really varies amongst patients. Um, how much laxity is there? How old are they? Um, and, and that really is dependent on how much weight did they gain throughout their life and how, how old were they when they lost it? You know, how many years did they hold on to 100 pounds? There's going to be a lot more laxity if they're older and they gained quite a bit of weight and had it on for 5, 10 years. Um, if it was a 25 year old girl who just had a baby who barely has any laxity, you know, it just, it bounced back almost all the way, but not completely, then she may only need six treatments. But if it's someone who's 50, who had gained hundred pounds, had it on for five years, and they have a lot of loose skin on their arms, on their abdomen, on their thighs, wherever it may be, they could need upwards of eight, 10, sometimes 12 treatments. You, I typically wouldn't. Well, I wouldn't say typically, I wouldn't go over 12 um, because also remember that the whole process of remodeling all of that matrix, which is like the elastic and, and fibers and the collagen fibers and everything that we're targeting takes a really long time. It takes three to four months, even up to six months on some older patients for really the proliferation of collagen. Because what we're, we're not just going in there and rebuilding collagen in one treatment. What we're doing is we're telling fibroblast cells to get to, get to work. There's a, a little, um, how do we activate fibroblast cells? They need to think there's some type of injury going on. So like when we cut ourselves, fibroblast cells go in there and start to secrete these fibers, these proteins to build these fibers to heal. That's what we heal with, collagen and elastin. So if, um, if we are able to stimulate them with heat and say, there's a little microthermal injury here, heal it, it will do its job. So that's why we're using heat to do that. But that whole process of actually secreting these fibers, these proteins and these fibers and everything rebuilding and remodeling and we're getting the matrix tight, that takes, and thick and all of that, that takes a long time, three to four months up to six months. So if you do 12 treatments or eight treatments, however many you do, make sure you tell the patient, this isn't your final um, result because you're doing before and after photos every time they come in. So at their last treatment, tell them, in three to four months when you come back for your follow-up and for your maintenance treatment, then we'll sit down and look at your before and after photos from, the, from three to four months after you've seen me because it's just going to keep getting better. So I would do up to 12 if you need to, if someone has a lot of loose skin, wait three to four months, have them come back in, and then reassess if they possibly could use a few more. Um, but I would say most of the time it's six to eight treatments. Uh, but you know, it always, it always varies depending on, on the patients. Um, okay. So how often are they coming in? It's every two to four weeks. It's best to have your younger clientele under 60, six zero to come in every two weeks because they can get to their endpoint faster. But when they're older than 60, that healing process takes longer the proliferation of collagen takes longer. So it's best to have them older than 60 come in every three to four weeks, just to give that little bit of downtime for healing. Um, I always explain it like this. 
if I went into the hospital for a surgery and my grandmother went into the hospital for the exact same surgery, most likely who would be out sooner? Most likely myself, just because I'm younger, I'm, I'm gonna heal faster than my grandma. She may need a couple days extra in the hospital for healing. Same thing with the skin. It just takes, it, it's a lot slower of, of a healing process because there's not as much vascular in the, in the skin um, for healing. So it's just best to wait every three to four weeks older than 60. And then they can come in every two weeks if they're younger than 60. So now maintenance, and then we'll talk about the lower face and submental. Um, maintenance is going to be typically one treatment every three to four months. If they're younger and they're really holding their results well, then they can a lot of times space it out every six months. But optimally, it would be every three to four months for, for those optimal, um, long, long lasting results. Now, is it gonna last forever? Because I always get this question. No, what, I mean, yes, but no. If I got a facelift right now at 39, would I still look as young as I do 10 years from now at 50, even with a facelift? No, there's no way of slowing down our chronological aging. There is a way with devices to, um, if, if they're doing treatments and, and getting those things done, yes, then there is a way of slowing that down. But genetically, if I'm 90 and I work for Viora and I get treatments done every month, Am I still going to look 40 at 90? No, there's things that we just can't stop. But we are able to keep that skin integrity very healthy and as tight as it can be throughout their life if they stay on maintenance. So will they have some crepey skin in their 70s? Probably. But will they have this really loose, hanging, sagging skin that they did after weight loss? No, not if they really stay on their maintenance treatments and they're really good at staying out of the sun, they're not smoking, those types of factors. Um, so I can never say that things are gonna last forever because nothing will last forever, but it's, it's not gonna you know, go back to this, you know, a lot of hanging skin that they possibly had after a lot of weight loss. It'll stay much, much tighter throughout their life if they're doing maintenance sessions. Okay, so now we'll talk about the lower face in refit. Does somebody have a question? I have a quick question. Yeah, please, please. Um, so I usually use that rule of thumb where, you know, if they're younger than 60 years old every two weeks. Um, but I currently have a situation where um, this woman, um, she's doing the front of her um, side, more like the knee area. And she is like, I need to have this done in the next four weeks because I am having surgery and blah, 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 blah. And I don't know how to explain to her that I need to wait two weeks. She wants to get her four treatments back to back. So would that be something bad for her? It would, yeah. So this happens a lot actually. Refit shows an instant contraction of the tissue because of the heat. And people get super excited because they see it works. And, and taking, taking this lady, at, you know, she has something coming up, so she, she wants to get it done faster. But even people that don't have something coming up, they get excited and they're like, oh, can I come next week? Can I come the week after? Oh, and they get excited and you're like, no, slow down. And it would be an, an issue. And the reason being is, and this is how I'd explain it to her, it would be like um, going to the gym and I'm lifting 100 pound weights just on my biceps every day, every week for a month. And I never give a rest time. I'm going to probably end up injuring myself, injuring my, my bicep muscles because that's all I was focused on every day for weeks and months. And I end up getting an injury. It's similar. When we're going in with heat, what we're doing is we're telling the skin kind of wake up in a sense. Those fibroblast cells are woken up because they see that there's that microthermal injury with heat and it's, it needs to heal it. So if we go in there too soon, if we go in every week, we're not actually giving the downtime for it to do its job. 
So what we would be doing is creating kind of a thermal injury after a thermal injury after a thermal injury and never allowing the body to heal it. So it would be like kind of like cutting yourself and cutting yourself and cutting yourself and you're never giving your, your skin the time to heal. If we cut ourselves, we usually heal fine if it's not too deep because we left it alone and we, we let our body do its job heal it and now it's fine. But if we're, if we're cutting it and cutting it and cutting it, we're going to create a scar, right? Not that you're going to scar her, but that's just an analogy. Um, so it, it, it could even backfire on you or you're just not going to see the result that you're, that you're needing because you're not allowing the skin to actually do its job. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'll definitely <laughs> going to revisit and talk to her and make sure she understands. Perfect. <laughs> this will happen quite a bit because people get excited. And, and it's so funny because people want results now. I want it now, 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 now. But if they really understand the skin and how it works, you come at them at an educational perspective, you know, not to the point where you're talking over their heads and they're like, what are you talking about? But, you know, simplifying it and they understand the skin, then they'll, they'll understand and they'll go, okay, I'll wait. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, okay, so the face and and the lower face, I should say, and the submental, and why refit works so well for these areas. As we age, so let me back up. I always do this. When we're youthful, when we're young, we have an abundant amount of fat in our face, and it's evenly dispersed usually. When we age, we start to lose fat everywhere, but we dramatically you can see it in the upper face and we really start to accumulate fat down here plus laxity. So this is jowling, right? Jowls. So usually you can spot it and feel it. When somebody has jowls, it's not just loose hanging skin, but it's excess accumulated fat in that area. So with the refit, remember one third of the energy is gonna go down into the hypodermis and two thirds of the energy is going to focus on the dermal layers, the papillary and reticular dermal layers. So this is perfect for someone with jowls, not somebody who's bone thin, someone who's bone thin and has no fat at all, no issues there, then just the ST hand piece is perfect for them because they just need skin tightening. Maybe they have lines, maybe have some loose skin, but they don't have fat, just the ST. Um, if someone has a lot of fat, like really, you know, bigger neck and bigger lower face, and there's quite a bit of fat there, but there's also loose skin, then the relift protocol is perfect for them. I'm not going to go into too much detail of those because those are on another webinar, but I just wanted to kind of give a, um, a, a run through of those. Um, and if someone's young and a lot of fat and they have a double chin but no loose skin, then it would just be contouring in this area. Refit is typically our most popular protocol because as we age, usually most of us end up with jowls. So most of us end up with that fat accumulation, fat accumulation, loose skin, loose skin. So refit, one third into the fat layer, great. We're shrinking the fat cells. And we're stimulating lipolysis, right, for those adipocytes or adipocytes. And then two-thirds of the energy is going to the dermal layers, so collagen and elastic fibers. So we are doing both at the same time. We're shrinking the fat, tightening the skin, and it's such a dramatic, dramatic improvement in appearance. And what I always recommend is do half the face. And if they have the, this issue here, do here here, 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 for those 14 minutes, always stay low on the face though. You never want to target the fat here because this is what gives us our youthful appearance. When we smile and we have cheeks, it makes us look youthful. So you never want to do anything here to fat, but you do accumulate fat here and loose skin. So it's wonderful in this area. So do this area, this area, if they have an issue here too, Sit them up when you're done with that half and show them the difference, the left to the right. It's so dramatic. And that vacuum and circulation and mechanical stretch to the tissue, it's just, it, it gives a wonderful, wonderful tightening effect, but also shrinking the fat. So they usually sit up and go, oh my God, I'm so excited. It almost looks like someone's pulling their face. 
and then lay them down and do the other side. You don't have to do that every treatment, um, but I always recommend doing it for their first treatment. Same thing with like ST on the eyes. Do one eye, set them up, show them the difference, they get excited, and then continue. And then the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth treatment, you don't need to do that because they already know what to expect. Um, but yeah, for, for refit on the lower face and submental area, I would recommend that. Um, does that make sense, the refit for the lower face? And any questions on that? No questions? Just remember, you have to be very careful on, on the lower face and here because it can easily bruise and you don't want to create a lot of bruising. Um, and if someone's older and you, and you think, oh, they, they need it, and you start to pulse and they start to heavily bruise, stop. Even if you're on a vacuum one, stop. Their skin just can't handle that vacuum. You'll need to go to the ST. So we don't want complications like a huge hematoma um, or hemorrhaging, something like that. So, you know, make sure that you're choosing the right clientele for this. Um, you know, usually they're in their 40s, 50s, maybe 60s. Um, well, 60s, yes, because my mom's in her 60s and I've been treating her. Um, you know, 40s, 30s even. Some people start getting it in their 30s. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. When they start to get into their 70s or 80s, just be very careful on what you're choosing. You probably don't want to use a vacuum on their skin. Um, and you never want to use a vacuum over a two. Um, I usually start on a two just to get them preheated quickly. And then you always drop it to a vacuum one anyways for the protocol. Um, but if they say I have an event coming up and it's their first treatment, you don't know if they bruise or not, just do a vacuum one. Just take a little longer to preheat them to not bruise their, their face or neck. Okay, I have a, something in the chat here. I've done that. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Um, I, I have two in the past where, you know, they sign their consent form, they say they're not on blood thinners, and I start to pulse on them and they bruise right away. I'm like, whoa, are you sure you're not on blood thinners? And then I question them about what they're taking and then, yep, they're on blood thinners. You know, I stop right away. Um, tell them to use a little bit of Arnica, but yeah, be very careful with that. I mean, of course, like usually I'm rushed in a training, but with you guys in a consultation and taking your time, going through the consent form, asking them what kind of like over-the-counter medications they're taking, because maybe they don't know fish oil and aspirin and, um, you know, all these different vitamins they may be taking are blood thinners. So maybe they don't know. So you guys will probably take longer in the consultation, going through that consent form, making sure that everything's right, um, before you really choose different protocols and treatments for them. Um, but just remember if they're very thin, um, they're not going to need this. If there's no excess fat there and it's just loose skin, they're not going to need this. It's really those patients that have jowls um, or pre-jowling that really benefit from the refit protocol here and here. And of course, it works so beautifully for the body. Well, I think I covered everything. This is my fastest webinar ever. I actually thought it was gonna be 30 minutes and I went 45, I'm shocked. <laughs> um, any questions, any advice like you, have a specific patient you're wondering about, um, maybe you're not seeing what you're wanting to see, anything like that. I just have one quick question. Yeah, of course. About when the treatment says, for example, on the refit or any um, module they'll be using, when it says 15 minutes, is that like for the stomach, is that the overall stomach or you're dividing the stomach into two, 15 one side, 15 the other side? So it depends. Do you have the V form? I just got my, I just upgraded to the V10 this week. Oh, that's amazing. So you were a reaction? Yes. <gasps> oh my gosh, congratulations. I'm super excited for you. So um, <laughs> it's gonna be a huge difference. And yes. not, I mean, in result, I mean, you know, you probably got good results with the reaction, otherwise you probably wouldn't have upgraded to the V10, but it's gonna be such a nice thing with like how easy it is to use that you're not like 
wearing yourself out, that you're getting to temperature really easily, that you could treat a much larger area, larger BMI. So that's what's nice about the V-form for sure. So it, it all depends. So if it's um, someone much larger with loose skin, let's say they were 300 pounds overweight and they've lost 100 pounds, um, so their, their mass is bigger, then you may need to divide that. But most people, no. Most people, you'll be able to do the full abdomen in the one treatment. So just always remember, what is your temperature reading? In, when, you, when you're preheating them, are you getting to temperature with the whole abdomen? Awesome. And you know, you may need to go five minutes on the full abdomen and getting them to temperature. But once you do, you know, great, I don't have to divide this. It, it goes from a 40 minute treatment to a 20 minute treatment. It's half your time. So I would try to do the full area in one, the full abdomen in one. Um, if they need their flanks done as well, then you probably just need to divide the abdomen in half, do all the, the flanks and then into the abdomen and then the other flank into the abdomen. But if it's a really tiny girl and she has a little loose skin on her flanks and a little loose skin on her abdomen, then usually you can keep the heat the whole time. Um, even on a girl who's like thinner, who has cellulite, for example, a lot of times you can keep heat on both legs. So I preheat the left leg, then I go to the right leg and I preheat it. And then I go back to the left, get it heated, which usually takes a minute. And then I just go back and forth. Right leg, left leg, and I and I'm done with both legs in 20 minutes, which is awesome. Oh wow! I learned no. how to do that. It's so so great, and but they have to be you know thinner. If it's someone with like you know regular leg that's not really thin, then usually you do one leg at a time. Then, um, so it varies. But I think as you play around with it and you see how easy it is to preheat patients, you'll know like, wow, I can do much larger areas than I could with the reaction. So I would try to do as large as you can because moving forward when they come in, their treatments are going to be so much shorter. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Any other questions? No. Um, there's a lot, you know, more detail. Not not so much on the refit because I definitely covered the detail of it, but there's a lot more detail on just our the full system. You know, like how is radio frequency working with the tissue? Why do we need to drink so much water before every treatment? Um, why would you choose relift over refit over ST for the or contouring for the lower face and submental? All of those details are on our RF webinar. It was one of the first ones I did. So it's if you go on to the vioraonlineacademy.com and keep scrolling, it's one of the first webinars I did. I think it was was the first. So that is um, the RF webinar and that and it goes into a lot of detail on those type of questions where this one went into more detail I think on the refit um, but oh, additionally I'll just let you know too stretch marks it works really well with stretch marks too um, reason being is stretch marks it, they're they're usually very deep just like scars they're reaching all the way into the reticular dermis so we're helping to remodel the, the, the tissue surrounding the dead tissue to shrink the stretch marks and size and also the appearance, like the texture of them. Um, but sometimes stretch marks need a little extra, a little extra love. So you can always use the ST over the stretch marks after the refit protocol. If you have microneedling, you can do um, microneedling on top of it after you're done. That also helps with tightening. Um, if you have the pristine, our microdermabrasion, or just microdermabrasion in general, you can do microdermabrasion first, even on the loose skin, remove the dead skin cells, get the circulation going, then go in with the refit protocol, then go in with microneedling and really get them to their end goal much faster. Um, that's also something you could do, like you were asking me about the patient with her, with her knees and that she wants to come in sooner, more often to get her result. If you do combination treatments, you'll get her there faster. So if you offer things like microneedling, you can always do it on top of 
the radio frequency when you're done um, to, to really get them there faster. So of course, think of like combination for loose skin or for stretch marks to, to really get them there faster. I keep saying that. <laughs> okay, I have one more. Oop, I got lots in the chat. Yay. Okay, um, awesome. Stretch marks with ST applicator. Okay, ST plus RF. Thank you. Um, the, well, the ST uses radio frequency. So you can do the refit on, let's just, I'm just gonna take a, a woman post baby belly. You can do um, the refit protocol and then you can use your ST and put ultrasound gel and go right over and right around the stretch marks, a little additional love. Um, or you can use like combinations like microderm and microneedling and things like that. Just never, always do microneedling last because you never want to put heat um, over freshly microneedled skin. It can create complications. So you could do the heat first and then do, um, do the microneedling. So you're getting a microthermal injury to the tissue and then you're getting a, a controlled mechanical injury to the tissue. So those fibroblast cells are like, yeah, let's get to work and start really producing collagen elastin. I hope that makes sense. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, good, that made sense. <laughs> well, all right, you guys, I guess um, no more questions. So we will wrap up. I hope this was helpful for you guys um, and have a wonderful weekend. We will have another webinar um, next week. There, will, there won't be one, but the week after. We'll have a webinar um, if you guys can join, wonderful. Uh, and if not, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a great weekend.